Ooh, I love a good story, and I bet you do too. So this week, we're going to be hearing the tale of the first ever Association for Cider in North America. We got that and a whole lot more on this year episode 299 of Cider Chat. Hello, my name is Rhea Wincaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. Yes, Cider Chat goes around the world. In fact, season six, which we're going to be putting to an end on, well, this week and next week with episode 300, we kicked off the season with Barry... (laughs) Just an amazing guy out in Germany. He's an Irishman, and as such, I called him an Irish expat in Germany with Kilter Rider Cider. And if you haven't followed Barry yet on Twitter, where he is very active, you should, because he's always putting out such good cheer, telling his story of how he is helping to save Perry Pears when he's pressing, what cider he's making. And I want to tell you, this guy makes really good cider. So that's how we kicked off episode 251 for season six, which, again, is going to be coming to a close. (laughs) But that's okay, because when one door closes, another door opens. Talk about synchronicity. That was just a knock on the door. Come on in. Well, hello, Lady Apple. What a pleasant surprise. Hello, Rhea. I suppose you're here because you heard that we are slowly leaving season six and we're going to be having our 300th episode next week. You probably got the party invitation. It's the talk of the orchard. Well, now I'm blushing. Blush away, my dear. (laughs) It's quite attractive. You're absolutely correct, lady. It's the best part of an apple. And now I will blush away freely. That's nice, dear. Where can I bring these bags of cider? (coughs) Madam Lady. You could bring them into the production room. Of course, Mr. Quince. I'll be right there. Meddlers, can you get the door for Lady Apple? You bet! And maybe we should keep a count of how many bottles we have for next week's party? We never run out of cider, Rhea. No, I suppose you don't, Lady. Okay, thank, thanks for coming on in. I kind of feel like I'm really blushing now, even saying that to an apple about cider. Anyways, uh, Mr. Quince, can you cue up that music that we were talking about earlier? The one that I want to dedicate to that particular patron who actually just donated one of the largest sums ever to Cider Chat to date. And this particular patron of Cider Chat has been there since the beginning for over six seasons now, each year donating the the largest amount each year, which kind of blows me out of the water because this individual has no invested interest commercially in cider, just loves the whole community, loves what Cider Chat is doing to connect, and actually loves this little transition piece that we're going to play in a moment. So, um, wow, I just want to really thank you, man. I know I know, you know, I'm talking about you right now. You're listening and a big tip of the glass for keeping Cider Chat in such good cheer for your amazing generosity and all the apples that you have grafted, all the peri pear trees that you have grafted and the way that you bring such joy to people's lives in just a really nonchalant, just part of your being. Uh, It's a model that we can all embrace. So, Tip of the glass to you, Joby, and cue it up, Mr. Quince, please. You gotta grab that luche. You gotta bust that thing. Get your kicks on the street. Gotta kick back, step back. Oh, you got to ski. It's a rat a tat a rat a tat a rat a tat a bala. Rat a tat a rat a tat a rat a tat a hala. I don't wanna be pushed like a dude the push yeah. When it comes to the cheddar, keep it under the cushion yeah. I don't wanna be ganked like a dude the gank yeah. When it comes to the cake, be me a yeah. thank I don't wanna be pushed like a dude the push yeah. When it comes to the cheddar, keep it under the cushion yeah. I don't wanna be ganked like a dude the gank yeah. When it comes to the cake, be me a yeah. thank The American Cider Association invites you to their 12th annual CiderCon, a global cider conference for cider professionals. CiderCon is taking place February 1st through the 4th, 2022, in beautiful Richmond, Virginia, at the heart of a celebrated cider region. With tours, tasting, 
educational workshops, demos, and more, CiderCon's return to an in-person event is bound to be one of the most energetic CiderCons to date. There's loads of awesome cider making sessions that will be offered. Whether you're just getting started or an expert cider maker, there's something in these sessions for everyone. Learn to problem solve in the cidery with sessions like A Cider Among the Faults or Hunting for Spoilage Microbes. Learn from other industries in sessions like Barrel Programs, A Wine Perspective for Cider, or Towards Sustainable Cider, Lessons from the Craft Beverage Industry. Or take a deep dive into production by attending sessions like How Chemistry Parameters Lead to Style Outcomes, or Cider Packaging and the Production Decisions that Get You There. Attend a tasting session like Fruited Ciders, Beyond the Apple, Best Practices for Producing Cider with Residual Sugars, Survey of Yeast-Derived Characteristics and Hands-On Blending, and Wild, Clean, and Free, Harnessing the Beauty of Wild Fermenting Without the Flaws. Register soon because these tasting sessions are filling up fast. Tickets to CiderCon are just $435 if you book by January 20th. To learn more about the wide array of events and educational sessions being offered and to register for CiderCon, head to the American Cider Association website today. CiderCon is an ACA member event produced with the generous support of members and sponsors. Learn how to become an ACA member or sponsor today by going to ciderassociation.org. Along with CiderCon and the American Cider Association sponsoring Cider Chat, we also have our annual sponsorship from the New York International Cider Competition. Now, I had Adam Levy, the producer of this event, on the podcast back in a couple seasons ago. I'll put a link in the show notes to that so you can listen to the full coverage of what he's doing as the alcohol professor, which is kind of like a moniker that, (laughs) you know... Dude, you got to be able to walk with that one, right? (laughs) Um, And he produces these events all over the world. He does it for spirits. He does it for cider. He does it for beer. And what separates his cider competitions from all others is that the judges are in the business of buying the cider. So it's pretty cool if you are a cider maker and you want to get feedback on how your cider fits in the price point of the market, whether or not people feel it's really hitting on the nose what their consumers and customers want to purchase. Well, this is the competition for you. Plus, you get really cool medals. And it's run by a guy who is super professional and revving up competitions all over for these specific niche audiences. I love it. And, you know, originally it was a cider and beer competition and it became so successful that now he has the New York International Cider Competition as a standalone event. The competition takes place in February, so it's never too soon to start thinking about what ciders, if you're a commercial cider maker, because this is for commercial makers only, that you want to squirrel away now and put in the perfect little conditioning room and then get it ready to be shipping or delivered to the New York International Cider Competition. Go to nyicidercompetition.com. Uh, I see that Adam Levy was on Season 3, Episode 108. And the actual competition, I should mention, is coming up on February 21st, 2022. Again, just go to nyicidercompetition.com. Oh, and by the way, uh, Perry Pear, thank you very much for handing that to me. Indeed, Rhea, no problem. And by the way, if you're new to this podcast, well, allow me to introduce you to the Talking Palms, because you might be wondering who I'm talking to when I'm saying Perry Pear or Mr. Quinn's or the Medlars and this week in the studio, Lady Apple, Uh uh-huh, well, they are the Talking Palms, and uh, that's the magic of Ciderville. We have Talking Palms, so go figure, right? That's what happens when you want to create magic, you want to believe in something, dreams come true. And that that's what cider, cider making, uh, perry making is all about, is believing in possibilities and not allowing obstacles get in your way. So uh, they are my my dear friends and many of you out there in Ciderville who have been listening for so long or even recently, I know that you kind of love those talking palms too. Thank you, Ria. You're welcome, Medlars. All right. Well, we're going to move on to another segment here. (laughs) 
We have someone who's going to be receiving a copy of Tasting Cider by Aaron James. This is a book, Tasting Cider by Aaron James. And this little, I guess, sponsorship, you might call it, was spearheaded by a Cider Chat patron by the name of Carl Ole. Carl's based up in Vermont, and he had this idea to ship out a book to the next person who signed up at the Cider Chat Patreon page at the Raise a Glass level. And that was Mitchell. And Mitchell wrote, When I heard you say on the podcast two episodes ago that the next patron to sign up at the $10 a month got a book, I thought for sure it would have been scooped up already because I was listening to the podcast a couple days after you posted it. Then you said on last week's podcast that the book was still up for grabs. I had to take a shot. I've been meaning to become a patron for a while, and that pushed me over the edge. I think it was a sign because recently I have been trying to hone my palate a little and reading Tasting Cider is probably a good place to start. Yeah, I think so. That's awesome. Before I answer your questions, I just first have to say how much I appreciate your podcast. I'm sure you hear it all the time from your listeners, but what an amazing gift to all of Ciderville. It is an absolute treasure trove of information, pure gold. Aww. For me personally, I have a hard time putting into words how much I appreciate what you have created in Cider Chat. It has been a source of encouragement when I needed it so many times this past year that I have lost count. Thank you, thank you, thank you. He wrote about how he found Cider Chat was by searching on Spotify. He was looking for a source of cider-oriented content and found the podcast there. And then on his journey... His journey began when his wife and he moved from their home in Prince George, British Columbia, to an acreage outside of town. There were two old apple trees on the property that had a whole bunch of beautiful apples on them that fall. Not knowing what to do with them, he decided to make some cider. He chapelized it and these days would probably call it an apple wine. (laughs) Yeah, well, if you add a lot of sugar, you're going to be upping the ABV, and in my mind, once you get over into like the 11% range, you are kind of hitting more of a wine-like profile. Uh, Anywho, he somehow managed to stabilize it semi-sweet with a touch of carbonization in corked wine bottles. Yikes, the cider gods must have been feeling benevolent because looking back, I don't know how I managed that without a single complication. That cider was amazing and I was hooked. I started trying every cider I could craft or otherwise figure out more about this beverage that had previously been invisible to me. There were very few options in my neck of the woods in those days. The first cider I bought was an Angry Orchard Crisp. In 2018, we moved to Vancouver for four months while my wife studied for a semester at UBC. While there, my four-month-old daughter got me an absolutely incredible Father's Day gift, a two-day trip to Salt Springs Island, British Columbia, to visit a craft cidery for the first time. Wow! It was an amazing experience. After that, I was even more hooked and started actively planning to one day start my own cidery. And now, in 2021, I am proud to say, am I allowed to ask Mr. Quince for a drum roll? Indeed you are. (laughs) Indeed you are, Michael. Mr. Quince, could you roll out the drum? (coughs) My pleasure. We received our winery license a couple weeks ago and are going to press our first batch of cider this weekend. Right, Medlars? <laughs> he continues with, I typically like dry tannic ciders that have a lot of character and maybe a little funk and not too acidic. As you will know, sometimes the language around cider is a little imprecise. Not sure about elsewhere, but here in BC, a few cideries use scrumpy as a style name. There is one scrumpy in particular that floored me. It had what I think was barnyard or maybe old horse. Whatever it was, I loved it. Mmm, my kind of cider. I love it all, but I always pay extra close attention to any of your guests that are located in harsher climates who talk about the particular variety of apples that work well for them. I am fairly far north, and we have somewhat harsh winters, so it's something I spend a lot of time researching. On that note, I couldn't figure out how to access the bonus clip from episode 295 on Western Cider. Would you be so kind as to explain that to me? Well, let's see. Let's go into the Cider Chat Patreon page here. And uh, click on that post, and up on top where it says bonus clip Western Cider Orchards and Cider Making, a little audio player should show up, and it's a 10-plus-minute clip. 
So check that out. If you have difficulty with that, I will send you the clip directly. And that's true for any of the patrons out there wanting this extra bonus info. And for anyone else out there in Ciderville who wants to help out this podcast, well, it is listener supported. So become a patron today. You could go to the Cider Chat Patreon page. It's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Or go to the donate button at ciderchat.com. It's time now for our featured conversation with Elizabeth Ryan of Hudson Valley Farmhouse Cider, based in New York. It's just outside of New York, in the Hudson River Valley, thus the name. Uh, Just a, a glorious apple region of many, many cider makers. Elizabeth was previously on the podcast on episode 287, and there she was talking about her own personal journey of getting into apples and how that came via wine. She then went on to become a pomologist at Cornell University, and was really instrumental in so many ways for New York State, for farmers markets, and holds an encyclopedia of knowledge in her head that is magnificent. So it's really quite remarkable. Whenever I sit down with her and she begins talking, I try to pull out my recorder, which is exactly what I did after I hosted a cider share at my home. Elizabeth spent the night, and this was recorded in my living room in the early morning (laughs) Maybe it was a little bit later because it was a late night. As she started telling about what happened in the U.S. and the first association called the North American Cider Association. So we're going to go into that a little bit. I'm going to go on a little bit about Martinelli's and their experience in cider in America. I had a conversation with John Martinelli that was, I think, a, a magnificent historical piece on that family's mark in cider in California. Uh, you'll hear that. And I also want to do a couple of corrections and things here before we get into it, you'll hear her mention B.F. Clyde Cider Mill. That is based in Connecticut, and they have the oldest steam-powered cider mill in the country. It's not open this time of year in the winter, but it is open the rest of the season. And um, I called it uh, Clydesdale. I don't know why, because I think the guy who takes down the trees in my yard, his name is Clydesdale. (laughs) Anyways, it's B.F. Clyde Cider Mill. She also mentions Mark Serini. He is an attorney. He has spoken many times at CiderCon. I have a recording of him speaking about the history of alcohol law. That's episode 167. I will have a link to that. Mark is now retired from the firm that he's been working at, um, but he sounds like a treasure trove. And so I might be having a follow-up conversation with Mark about the history of the North American Cider Association. She also mentions Jeff House, who up to just recently was the founder and owner of Ace Cider out in California. And and interestingly, just a couple days after we had done this recording, it made big news when when we heard that Ace Cider had been sold to Vintage Wine Estates, uh, which is the 15th largest wine seller in the U.S. or wine manufacturer. You kind of manufacture when you're at that big level, aren't you? Anyways, uh, so that was a big uh, big reward, I think, for the, the, the House family. Uh, so good luck with that. So those are some of the people you're going to be hearing, um, and we're going to dive into it next and take this kind of long boat kind of conversation that is just really a treasure trove of information. So Definitely grab a glass and join this chat with Elizabeth Ryan of Hudson Valley Farmhouse Cider. I was in love with cider and the idea of cider. Uh, started at Cornell in, you know, in the, in the late 70s. I graduated in 80. And uh, nobody, nobody except a handful of, I mean, the, nobody made or drank cider. Period. I mean, it just wasn't in the vernacular. Everybody wanted to drink wine. If you were doing the cool stuff with alcohol, you were experimenting with these new cultivars, and that's where it was all happening. And cider was still considered some kind of bastard child of of wine. I remember Bob Poole used to say, well, it's really just 
a low alcohol white wine, is what he would say, the um, viticulture professor. So fast forward, I have, you know, buy this orchard. I, I managed vineyards a couple of years. I buy this orchard that has all these amazing old varieties on it. It's like, like insane. You know, there's Baldwins and Spies and Gravenstein and Russets and um, on, on at Breezy Hill. You know, it was like nobody was growing these apples. I didn't know anybody in, in the Hudson Valley who was growing them. And I wanted to ferment and I didn't know anyone who was fermenting. I didn't know anyone who was making cider and I heard about these people in Massachusetts uh, um, Terry and Judy and I went to see them and I I fell in love I mean I fell in love with their vision and their life and their cider and they made a Baldwin cider and we were growing Baldwins and um, this must have been I in the in the kind of you know mid 80s so we started doing a lot of programming at our farm and um, we started doing a thing, a pear and apple festival with craft beverage. There wasn't very much craft beverage around, and um, Terry started coming over and pouring and selling at our little event and selling hard cider. It was it was just, you know, enchanting. We started this voyage of you know promoting this wonderful beverage. I sort of dreamed of it. Our first slogan was, we're returning America to its rightful drink. I mean, it was really a ridiculous... So, Love um, the Baldwin. Love the Baldwin. One of our oh favorites. my God, Baldwin. Baldwin! Yeah. And, you know, very iconic because Baldwin was one of the leading apples grown in New York, probably New England, um, Definitely. in 1905 when Apples of New York was published. You know, they cited Baldwin as one of the leading apples in production. So, anyway, um, uh, I was interested also in story like you and, and, you know, collecting this information. And I I, um, felt that we needed some kind of organization. And Terry uh, immediately was like, well, I'll have the meeting and you find the people and I, we started combing through New England, and we couldn't find anybody. Our joke was that, you know, old cider makers were, were mostly gone. They were dead. I mean, they were dead. And mm-hmm. so... And, and, my, and this was... Uh, I want to say... 97. I'm going to have... It, no, it was before 97. It must have been either 96 or 97. Judith might remember. Well, um, Saturday started in 94. Okay. So that would kind of... But I wasn't then. Maybe Cider Days had started, and I just wasn't looped in. Well, it was only but, it was kind of a small, like, like um, we were talking last night about it. And, but uh, we, we had this meeting at um, Terry and Judy's place, and uh, um, the senior gentleman from B.F. Clyde came down, which was extraordinary, and he really represented to me uh, legacy in the legacy. old guard. Um, of course, it's tragic that it wasn't recorded. Mm-hmm. He came with some of his family. Joe Cerniglia came down. Mm-hmm. The and founder we, of Woodchuck. The, the founder and an irascible and fascinating individual. But not a Vermonter um, himself. Not a Vermonter. He's from New York. He was a guy who had been on Wall Street, had had a heart attack, and had moved to Vermont for the good life and decided to start... Um, cider. A cider company, and I, I think I can say officially, I mean, he he said to me, and I, I got in my car and drove to visit anybody I could find, and uh, he said to me, I, I make, I buy the cheapest, dirtiest concentrate on the world market, I turn it into uh, cider in three days, and I'm <laughs> proud of it, and I'm not going to lie about it. And I provide work for a hundred Vermonters. Well, that's something to be proud and, of. Uh, the work. I least. yeah. And, dirty, and, and, what and, is dirty and, apple juice? What do you what mean? Dr- he meant um, unrefined. He oh. meant you know. And okay. then the other thing is because that he, have a very he had meeting. he had bought an old you know beer line and and uh, and then he uh, you know he 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 was you know he smoked a cigar. He was like this. 
he had a this character. wonderful office with all the iterations of Woodchuck. And I said to him, uh, <laughs> it's a great story, but he, I said to him, but you, don't people get you confused with um, Woodpecker, which was one, really the leading brand over here. And he said, that's the whole point. I'm going to make those bastards so miserable they're going to have to buy me out. And, I, and he said, I'm going to get as close to their trade dress as I can, and I'm going to get as big as I can, and they're going to have to buy me, and that's my exit strategy. So, you know, he had like a kind a of pirate, of, yeah, uh, cider. yeah, wow, yeah. So interesting. And, and he was <coughs> the only game in town, and, you know, very quickly there were other, I don't even want to get into the hall, other this minute competitive landscape of the startups and cider, but we were... Why not? In, let, let, let's, well, just, just to say, at that time, cider was being taxed at $1.07 a gallon, a dollar seven a gallon, and so you know, do the math. Uh, and what is uh, it being taxed now? Just to be making it relative. Well, you, you know, uh, you can qualify for various and sundry credits, but mm-hmm. you know, whatever twelve cents, you know, seven cents so with a, the full. I mean, right, the, a big difference. And yeah, so we we knew. First of all, I was into the you know culture and folklore and reviving the tradition and. All the stuff, I mean, really, you know, Terry and Judith already had this vision of Mm -hmm. this kind of revival, I'll call Mm -hmm. it, of Mm -hmm. cider. And and it really happened here with Cider Days. But Bulmers, you know, it was a classic odd coalition because the big guys, they didn't care. They just wanted to save money. Mm -hmm. They wanted to save money, and they needed Bulmers. I would say in England they've been highly adept at... um, kind of creating the big umbrella so that when they go for legislative issues, they look like they're representing the small little Somerset grower. Um, and it's, it's, it, 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 it works, and they've always recognized that they should, and to their credit, I think, make investments in the industry and the mm-hmm. ciders, and they're not threatened by the small mm-hmm. brands. They view the small brands as sort of populating mm-hmm. a landscape of right. um, interesting ciders. So, um, I mean, that's one view. There, there are other people. I realize I'm being recorded here, so there, 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 there are other views. And I think the you know, um, you know, campaign for real cider would take a very, a very um, much more harsher, and mm-hmm. they would blame the big companies for the degradation of yeah. cider. But without getting into that here, you know, there wasn't anybody making cider mm-hmm. on any scale. And yeah. there had been various attempts after the war to introduce ciders. I actually met with an interesting guy who'd been importing French cider starting after the war, and he mm-hmm. said to me, he said, you're never going to get any traction. The only people, your cider's very good. The only people that are going to drink it are you and your friends. And that's not a very big market. Mm-hmm. You think there's a big market, but you're just talking to your friends. Well, so, Martinelli's was uh, <clears throat> making cider after Prohibition. They, they, um, you know, they, they were able to survive Prohibition. And they had their license up to 1979. I did and not know that. I How know. fascinating. That's very fascinating. And But <clears throat> it was like 1% of their of total you know, uh, business. And so at that point, they let go of their winery license. And only uh, in 2018, I'm going to say, is when they came back with their first fermented cider. Talk about legacy. And they won a gold medal. For oh. that, that cider here <clears throat> in New England at a beer competition that, well, it's not beer, it's the Great International Beer Cider Sake uh, Competition. And I, I was judging there, but I was not judging their particular cider, and they won a gold medal for common, you know, uh, under like a common kind of cider. Um, I, I think it's common, I'm not sure. Maybe modern. And it was like a huge that their first cider after 1979 won a gold medal that year, all with a focus of that kind of Martinelli Newtown Pippin mm. uh, apple that is really part of their juice. 
And when I was interviewing John Martinelli, who was the CEO of the company at the time, he's kind of stepped down, um, kind of retiring, you know, multi-generational Martinelli's. I, in the interview, he didn't even realize that his family had gotten a gold medal because their whole branding is gold medal cider, right? How and he crazy. flipped out. He, he, he nearly How fainted. He nearly like, are you kidding me? We got a gold medal. <clears throat> and they were doing it to celebrate their 100, 150th year in business. So they were, you know, a lot of times you think of West County as the OG, but actually Martinelli's is the OG in that way, and a successful one, they dropped it, and now with new members of the family and cider going, they are keeping that. I think that's a really sweet story. Isn't and it? It's really sweet. And, they, and it is a lovely family. And, and they, like, they ship their juice to Dubai. I mean, it is an international, big, big, privately owned company. So we don't really know how big they are because they're privately owned, but... Uh, and, and they're just in uh, Watson Valley, which at one time was Apple City. Well, we knew that we had to get the taxes reduced. We knew that that was just prohibitive. And and it didn't matter whether you were big or small. If you were big, oh my God, you'd save a lot of money. And so I felt that I had to do this. And I'd worked in Washington for a couple of years. I knew the Hill. I ran a sustainable ag project, you know, in in the late 70s. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, we, we, we knew we could do this. We thought we could do it, um, but our industry was very, 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 very small. I mean, you're talking a handful of people. Well, let's go back, back to that. So we were talking about the the trail to going to Seattle. So you went out to Seattle. So, well, I felt we had to have the West Coast, and I actually funded this. I mean, I did it myself. I just did it because I was a community organizer, and I mm-hmm. wanted it to work, mm-hmm. and I wanted it to work for everybody. Um, and so I put together, um, by, then, by, then I, by then I had somebody, Bulmer somehow had heard about this, and Joe Cerniglia was all for it, Bulmer's had heard about it, and they aren't supposed to lobby ostensibly, but they said, well, we'll, we'll hire, we'll fund a lawyer. And uh, and this actually is, a lobbyist. Does this, this, this happen? I just want to get this yeah. chain of events. So here you are. <laughs> You're so, testing my my feeble brain, but uh, right, right. Well, um, you know, first first you met on the East Coast with yeah, Terry and that's Joe. Right, that's and, right. That's um, right. B.S. Uh, Clydesdale. Yeah. And then then you went out to the West Coast and yep. met in Seattle. Yeah. And kind of crashed. And we the crashed beer. crashed the the. Um, Big beer meeting beer in thing. Seattle, and I want to say that was '97. I can look it up. It might have. I think it was '97. And so by then, I had taken Peter Mitchell's course in England, and fallen in love with all things cider. In fact, I organized at Pike's Market a big cider dinner. Uh, we took over a restaurant, and everybody poured their cider, and we had. Um, Ian Wider from Wider Cider, Jeffrey House, he used to work, you know, for Bulmers. Um, we had the Bulmers guys. Who's, the eight, um, who's now Ace? Ace. He was yeah, Ace. Jeffrey he was, House was now Ace. <clears throat> he was already Ace then. And, and he, he was, started around he was, he was already. So. He was already. That's true, maybe um, earlier. Coming on. He was you know, earlier. Strong. And we had a yeah. lovely, lovely guy um, who made. Beautiful! Oh my God! It was growing bittersweets and bitter sharps, and made beautiful Alan. I can't remember Alan's last name. It will come to me. Beautiful, small batch, elegant US, ciders please. in Oregon. Oregon. And he he gave up at a certain point, um, and he um, he started growing. He put in Pinot Noir. And started producing wonderful Pinot Noirs. But he was at the meeting. Um, so, uh, so was this? I, I so believe the, Sebby Bueller, Steve Wood was at the meeting, and I organized a day long kind of symposium on cider and cider making. And Peter Mitchell, in, who in nobody, Seattle. I Seattle. think, yeah, I don't think Peter had ever been to the U.S. And it was sort of a, you know, coming out party for him because I felt people should know about this course. He was teaching in Hereford 
that was such a model for right. something that we could do to start to right. help people to understand cider making. So we had a kind of nice, we rented this big room and um, had a nice turnout. And then we formed the North American Cider Makers Association. And then we went, Mark Serini was there. I had invited Mark Serini. Attorney out, Mark Serini. Attorney fresh out of law <clears throat> school out to talk about could we write legislation? Was it conceivable? What we were trying to do are two things. We were trying to get the taxes lowered, and then we were trying to deal with what's called the bubble tax, you know, the carbonation issues. Mm -hmm. We were incredibly unsuccessful in dealing with, we had to let that go mm -hmm. in the interest of getting any legislation through. So, you know, you write a bill, you find a sponsor, you try to find a couple of sponsors. Good old Pat Leahy was all over from it. Vermont. He, from Vermont. Senator of Vermont. Senator of Vermont. And he kind of spearheaded the whole thing. Um, and then we wrote the legislation. I made a number of trips to Washington. At one moment, I went down and I visited, I think, everybody, everybody on the House Ways and Means Committee. And it took... A lot of wiggling and what you have to do when you introduce a bill is the bill has to be scored. Mm -hmm. And the scoring of the bill talks about if there's any tax issues involved, uh, what the, the, uh, the trade-offs are. What are the benefits of the bill financially? And what are, you, what are you gaining and what are you giving up? And so the argument that we made was, and it's actually turned out to be true, <laughs> um, you're going to lose the cider industry is in a very um, quiescent early state. You if you stimulate this by lowering the taxes, there will be many, many, many more producers, mm -hmm. and um, and and eventually this will be a real industry with a real revenue stream attached to it that will greatly offset. So if you pull the brakes off. <clears throat> and you allow people to produce and you incentivize them by not taxing them to death mm -hmm. on something that isn't even very, um, it's not a very high value, you know, cider. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, back then people were mostly producing six-pack mm -hmm. cider. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, we got the bill through and I was there the night it was voted on. Mm -hmm. I, I think Mark was in the room. There was another lobbyist in the room and I had gotten into chambers which in all my you know years of doing lobbying and never you know working for the you know family farm development act and various and sundry things it never is a really really incredible thing to actually um experience experience that. it yeah. and to see the the horse trading that goes mm. on mm. It, it's it, we just finished this kind of yeah. uh, horse trading this week and it, it on, on one level it's um, horrifying and on another level it, it, it feels still like mm -hmm. democracy in action mm -hmm. and so um, I remember the, the guy called me up and he said to me you you need to you know there's this lot of art to when you introduce a bill and what you do is you take a bill that in theory nobody cares about and at three o'clock in the morning, you <laughs> append the bill to a bill that you know is going to pass. <laughs> and the question of um, this, and this is, I'm afraid this is just how it goes down. At, um, this guy called me and he said, you need to get down here. He said, I know, I think you've been working really hard on this and there's going to be quite a spectacle and mm -hmm. it's great political theater, and you don't see this every day. And this is this is this is going to happen. Um, there was an employment bill that we <laughs> attached ourselves to, and he said, you know, it's it's you know people are split on this bill, and there's a rumor that the Democrats are going to walk out. That Charlie Rangel, there's a rumor that there's going to be a moment, you know. And they're going to threaten to walk out, and they're going to all stand up. And they're so he said, "What I ho I heard was that Charlie Rangel's going to stand up, and then all the Dems are going to stand up, and they're going to head for the door. You know, to a break drama, this. A little drama, you know, DC drama. And he said, and if they come back and sit down, 
if they don't leave the room, if they leave the room, it'll be over. But if they come back into the room, then I'm going to introduce the bill. Because there's going to be a moment, people are going to be tired, they're going to want the whole thing, and I'm going to, I'm, that's when I'm going to introduce, and he's like, it'll is this be really fun. three in the morning type of thing? Oh, three in the morning, yeah. Three in the yeah, morning. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and Charlie Rang- Rangel. He was, he was then, and uh, you know, I, I, I may have some of my facts, but mm-hmm. as I recollect, he was chair of the House and Ways mm-hmm. and Means mm-hmm. Committee, yeah. or he was chair of whatever when they're all like you know, so much younger too what a, a, so a so time. so i said to the guy well i can i get in the room i mean you know everybody wants to be in the room <laughs> and he's like we're not allowed to be in the room but we can go in the back door because the guard there i know the guard there oh, and i used to work at the white house and he thinks I still work for the White House. Oh, perfect. So the guy said to me, just go in the room. I mean, it was such a classic example of how shit gets done in Washington. No uh, it's it's Talk the about clubhouse. Back room. Talk about back, back room. room. And he said to me, whatever <laughs> happens, don't say anything. And if he asks who you are, don't say anything. And if he asks a question, don't say anything. Because if you say something, uh, they'll kick us out. We won't be allowed to be in there. But he said, but I think it's going to be one of these moments. It's going to be a great moment. And he, of course, wasn't personally introducing. Whoever was introducing the bill for us was introducing. So we go in there and we go past this um, big, huge, you know, guard. And he he looks at him. And when I first went to Washington, the woman I I worked for, who was very, very adept, uh, political you know, person <laughs> told me the first rule in Washington is never answer the question. Never answer the question. No matter what they ask you, never control the moment. Never answer the question. I obviously didn't get that memo, but um, <clears throat> but I did in Washington because I always answer the question. But uh-huh. but in any case, I'm not. I don't have a very good poker face. Uh-huh. But uh, but sh- but so we go in, and the guy at the door. <laughs> It, he just he he looked at this attorney and he says, "You're with the administration, right?" And the guy smiles, and I smile, and psh, and then we're in, and it, that it's exactly it, it happened. Um, wow. You know, it was a cheap thrill because uh, <laughs> it, you know the Charlie Rangel got up, and the whole the entire all the Dems got up, and they headed for the door, and that was you know the Republicans said. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe we can work something out. Wait a minute, and uh, and um, and it it passed. You know, Fantastic. this bill passed, and we, we were just peace force our there. little piece that dropped the taxes from one hundred and seven to I believe then I think it was seventeen cents, but then you got another That's credit. Huge. It and, was, and was it was under, huge. Was that under the North American Cider? Yes, I, and we uh, had had that, to form, you know. So you were successful. Mark, we were. It was. Yeah. It was. But it, but it had uh, the opposite effect. So, you know, we passed this thing, and immediately, massively more profitable. And the six pack cider guys. There were two or three. You know, Gallo had Hornsby at that Woodchuck. time. Uh, Woodchuck. Um, um, uh, and Bulmers. Gallo owned Hornsby. Yeah, Gallo had Gallo, Hornsby. When you say that, Gallo owned Hornsby. Yeah, it was saying. their brand. Okay. Yeah, it was supposed to have been like the Bartles so, and James. I didn't know that. I yeah, didn't know that they, owned uh, they never did well with it. It never. It, I don't think it ever it sold. It floated around for a while. It did. It, it did well. A company like and Gallo made its its um, impact. It's um, kind of like the Boone's Farm of uh, wine. Abs- absolutely. So what summer. happened was, you know, these guys all kind of got in these. Price wars. They had more margin, and <clears throat> I think premium cider barely existed, except in these. You know, I wanted to do a premium cider, right. and we were Less putting time. our cider in a seven fifty mill, and we were right. being distributed by Brooklyn Brewery, and also Wildman, Frederick Wildman, and we were, you know, kind of. It was just one. One knock on a door at a time, but then the the you know bigger companies just got into you know it became an alco pop and these price wars right. and it was a race to the bottom the classic race to the bottom. And I want to ask you about the association itself. Yeah. 
Um, so when it was formed, were there like uh, a, was there a board or officers or anything like that? And there, what, there was, was I up? believe, did I was had one by, of did them. You had bylaws and all we that? had bylaws. Mark would know all of this because so what happened set it up. was after we passed the legislation. That was the big push. It just dissolved. I mean, it fell apart. It the just association didn't, did. It didn't. Yeah, and Mark, Mark, Mark right. would know, but I'm not even sure. You know, uh, I had no, and I, I right. had then investors, and um, this was enormously time consuming. Mm-hmm. You can imagine. Mm-hmm. And these guys said to me, "No fucking way. Are you doing that anymore? You can't." What do we get out of it? What do you get out of it? All your time and effort is going into working for the greater good. And what do you get out of it? You know, personally, it's not good for us. You you must, you must stop this work. You must cut it out. Because they want to stay on, as a mega company. Well, they, yeah, not, no, I mean, we were tiny, but, you know, these people had put money into the company and they were like, you know, said to me, oh. literally, um... We don't want you doing this. So we don't want you going just, on these trips. We don't want you going to Washington. You're spending, you know, 30% of your time. Uh, and, and, there, and you know, you got the bill passed. That so was you part of it. You got the, the bill the passed. Executive so. director for the association? The I campaign? literally, you know, this is embarrassing, but I don't remember. Because Maybe Mark, I, Mark might remember. Um, Steve was on the board. I was on the board. I'm trying to remember, it was very small. Um, and what about uh, Canada? You mentioned Canada a little well, bit. Well, we wanted to include them, but yeah. that also never really, because actually, you know, we had this perception that more cider was being made in commercially Canada. in Canada. And Ian Wider, I, I, which I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know who of these fine people are still around. Um, and he was he was he was great fun, and he had started you know Wider Cider, mm-hmm. Ian Wider, yeah, and gone gone to Asia was doing a big project in China. I mean, these guys were kind of galloping, and mm-hmm. <clears throat> I was you know this little farm based you know based on this thirty five acre orchard. But uh, was there any other women involved in the association, or were you it? Oh, I, I, I think it was it, but I, I mentioned Sebby Bueller. She was a great kind of fanning the flame, and she was very highly regarded, you know, woman in the craft beer industry. She was the, had started with Rogue. She pretty much built, you know, she was the East Coast rep for Rogue, brought Rogue to the East get, Coast. We didn't really talk about how she got involved, at least not when I put on Well, she board. wasn't directly involved, but she was, you know, a great cheerleader, cheerleader. And, okay. and colleague and fanning the flames and mm-hmm. just kind of, yeah, you know. But, but I, you know, you were the only woman really in the, the board there for the association. Oh, yeah, but I, I to be honest, I didn't. I mean, as a I, I know, as an it, apple grower, it, I was so used yeah. to. I think I told you once. You know, I still go through this exercise where I go to meetings and I count the number of women in the room. And yeah, you know, and I, you, Vel used to going to fruit grower meetings where you look around the room and there's you know, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred guys, a handful of women. Most of the women actually work for Cornell or Extension mm-hmm. or. Farm credit or or, or right. something, and and I, I I have to say I mean I'm not trying to be an apologist, but you know it's 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 a complex thing, and um, uh, I felt very supported in by a lot of um, older men who yeah. really totally. mentored me in a very deep and and I'm sure you've experienced this totally. too. And when Mark Miller hired me. When I got out of Cornell and nobody would touch me with a 10-foot pole because I didn't grow up. Mark Miller, who had written the Farm Winery Act in 1976 yeah. and was an artist and was a visionary yeah. and a difficult human, but was an artist and a visionary mm-hmm. and had lived in Bordeaux and had lived in Burgundy and had come back to the Hudson Valley and bought the mm-hmm. oldest continuously operating vineyard in the Hudson Valley, transformed it, built a French-style small... Uh, almost like a manoir, and um, and started making, you know, with a really incredible palette, started making wonderful mm-hmm. um, 
uh, red and you know one of one of the only guys I knew who was really mm -hmm. making these wonderful red wines. Uh, but he so he, he hired me, and he said to me, I think I I told you he hired a young woman winemaker from California, um, and me. And he had 75 acres of grapes, and this was, I guess, 1980 or 81. And he, he said to me, I mean, you know, slightly you know, whatever, but he said, you know, it's time for the girls to have a chance. That's what I think. It's time for the girls to have a chance. And that was, you know, it very you unusual then. Very, I mean, yeah. you know, now yeah. it's not... Maybe these questions don't even matter the same way in the same context. I just think but, it's good to kind of note that historically. So oh, that's absolutely. I'm, I'm not trying to Abs make absolutely. a judgment one side or the other. I just think it's interesting to note that because young people now might not realize that that was a factor. Well, I'll tell and you. I think I'll it's important to kind of note that, that, yeah, I, she I was the only event, woman in the event, room. Eventually on the board of Cornell and on the eventually on the search committee, the, the, you know, for a new dean. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was on the meeting, you know, the big conference call, and we had all these resumes. Probably, you know, we had a short list of, I want to say, 20, maybe 20 candidates, all very eminent people. And we went through the list. These guys started going through the the list on the conference call and they're like oh well what about dr so and so he you know they were trying to decide who to interview and i want to say out of that list of 20 i think i think maybe six or seven of them were women and the other other you know maybe 12 were were men and they go down and they're going to interview five people and they pick five people and they're all men. And it just, it, 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 blew, it blew my circuits. And I was sitting there thinking, how can I diplomatically? But I was outraged. And I thought, they don't even know they're doing it. This is, this is the true glass ceiling. Yeah. They don't even know they're doing it. They're just working on a set of assumptions. So I said to... The person who was chairing it, I said, um, we've got 20 resumes here, right? And um, he said, right. And I said, these people have all been very well vetted, right? Yeah. Because they've made it into the final cut. And they were like, oh, yeah. And I said, and I can assume, you know, that, 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 that pretty much everybody on this list is extremely well qualified, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I said, so I'm going to point something out, which is that we've selected five people to interview, and they're all men. And there was this dead silence, and the, the person chairing the committee said, oh, my God. And, and he said, you know what we're going to do? He said, I think it would be wonderful if Cornell had the first woman dean. And it turned out I don't think there'd ever been in the entire country and we ended up hiring a woman dean. Um, because a but, little miss but Elizabeth Ryan fly on the spoke wall. up. Well, you know, noticed. maybe somebody else would have, but you got to call it when you see it, it sometimes. It, yeah. Well, you know, you had that particular Hawkeye view because you were pushing, doing the work in D.C. with Mark Miller. You were in the system long enough to kind of see what was going on, and you have this lovely way of kind of just Moving around and and endearing yourself to people. Well, you you and try so you, listen. you try to find that you walk that yeah. you do the same thing. You walk that fine line. Well, thank you. But sometimes, I, but I have a good role model. In but my but I I, <laughs> I think that I think I think it's a, there's been a paradigm shift, and uh, so to speak. And so I feel like we should turn the tape recorder off, but. You know me, well, I never put anything that's going to kind of mess you up. And, and you, you know, know don't, I, don't, I, think, I edit a lot. Though. I think we have a, a marvelous, and I saw this, I think we have a marvelous moment where Cider is, is, is being embraced with great enthusiasm. Yeah. And it, it's very <laughs> diverse, not diverse enough, but... It's, it's somewhat democratic because apples are so adaptable and they're, they're so, I mean, Liberty Hyde Bailey had a wonderful quote that um, 
Apples are plastic yet distinct. Apples are plastic, plastic yet yeah. distinct. What meaning plastic mean? in meaning uh, malleable, that they adapt to their environment, mm-hmm. but they maintain you know, their authenticity and their appleness, so to speak. And I just think it's a wonderful, you know, quote from a great horticulturist. Mm-hmm. But, but um, you know, apples are the most widely um, dispersed fruit in the world because mm-hmm. they grow literally, you know, in the everywhere in, in Tibet yeah. and Siberia, yeah, um, and South Africa. I mean, they're, I think they're, a lot of people think that America created the apple. I think because it's like as as American as apple pie. I think there's a lot of Americans that which which is a great kind of you know thing for them to believe in a way because they have ownership to it. Yeah. But I think a lot of Americans think that uh, apples only exist like we are the hub of of the apple, and I I think that's so interesting. Yeah, and I hope I hope you're wrong, but you're probably right I, because I think it's that's true. a very typical uh, ethnocentric view totally. of the world. But um, American is apple pie. You know? I mean, that's our slogan. You yeah. know, uh, uh, an apple a day takes doctor away. I don't think that's American, but ap- apple pie is kind of like mama and everything that was good coming out of the fifties or you know forties. Well, but I I have to tell you, it it is truly iconic in many ways. And uh, um, you and I both spent a lot of time in Europe with its incredible traditions and baking traditions and tart tatan, and we could go on and on about the amazing stuff that people um, have in their daily repertoire, you know, in Mm -hmm. France, the Mm -hmm. delicious, incredible Mm -hmm. things they eat. Mm -hmm. But we had a, a Dutch film crew come over, um, and they said to me, I said, what do you want to eat? And they said, apple pie. We want an American apple pie. And I said to them, oh, well, we, 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 make, we make hundreds of them every week. We can... We can um, interesting, and I I think of the apple pie to me as a uh-huh. as a humble kind of you know, it's not elevated. I mean, well, that's you what know, it was it's called. Almost, You're as humble as it, I guess. Saying that. Uh, it was a humble as apple pie. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean that that word is right there. So it, it's something. It's like a coziness, you know. An apple pie, it's a round shape. Yes, like even a galette is kind of can be. Yeah, very square. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. it's folded in, the French galette. But apple pie, something about that. And grandma making apple pie, and every American in the, uh, you know, pre industrial had apples outside their door and had. Everyone. Apple and my, pie. my mother, who grew up on a farm in Iowa, pie, and my father's family also, pie was in their literal daily. Repertoire, totally. they probably Party. made 10 or 20 pies a week. And I mean, at the country fair, I'm sure your family made yeah, more than the country fair it for was, judging. It was, there was always yeah, pie so on the counter, always. Yeah, and usually yeah. two or three kinds. Yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, um, so there's, interesting. there's some history, and now we have you know this revival of cider making, and we have this revival of, um, you know, of small scale artisan mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. cider making, so it's it you know it's it's a it's an interesting okay. moment, and I think you you know there's this lost history, and it's not that we. I always feel like I stand on other people's shoulders, but I think it's important for the kids, so to speak, and even the even the National Cider Association. Um, you know, it didn't all just kind of drop from the sky yeah. five years ago. Yeah. And I think that was a seminal piece of legislation, obviously getting um, some of the economics um, squared away. Yeah. Uh, does matter. It yeah, does matter. It, does, it, it is a form of a stimulus. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and similar things happen in the craft mm-hmm. beer industry and the small wine. I mean, people Mm -hmm. recognize you just had to take the lid off. I'm loving the ticking clock, Mr. Quince, that is so well pointed to this idea that it is about taking the lid off and economic stimulus of changing the taxes so that 
makers can get into the game. And that's kind of what associations are doing today, constantly. It, it's an issue in the U.S., it's an issue in other countries, and this is the type of people like Elizabeth Ryan and all these amazing people that she mentioned early on. Wasn't just American makers, Canadian makers, and European makers all paying attention to this because it impacts us all. You know, for instance, what Mitchell is doing out in British Columbia and how they're moving the cider brand forward, not just individual brands, but brands around the world has an impact and how we position ourselves moving forward, those of us who love cider. So, uh, Mom, I hope that you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Uh, Sitting and having Elizabeth Ryan sitting in my living room is kind of one of those pinch me moments. Uh, You know, that's what Cider Chat has done for me. And I think some of you out there too, feeling that, you know, we're a little bit bigger than just us. We're not alone. And we have friends out there. And I often hear from my friends who I think get a little jealous of my cider friend connections. And I can understand why, because, you know, to find cool people to hang out with, people that lift you up, who want to participate in life, who want to raise a glass in good cheer, have good constructive conversation, and just be in the beauty of life, that's a gold mine. And that's what cider brings to me, and I think to all of you out there in Ciderville. Would you like another tissue, Rhea? No, Perry Pear. I'm okay, thanks, buddy. Um, yeah, I get a little teary eye. I mean, this is big, and really big because this is episode 299, and next week it's episode 300, which is huge for all of us at Cider Chat Central. I mean, I can see that everybody in the production room right now is whooping it up because it's never too early to start celebrating all the good that life brings us, and certainly cider is one of them. So if you haven't subscribed to this podcast now, please do. And if you haven't told your friends about Cider Chat, well, please do, because folks out there want to be part of the party too. And that's what cider is all about, is, is sharing good cheer and bringing more and more people into the loop. So thanks for being part of my loop, Ciderville. And with that, I'm going to leave you here. This is Real Wind Caller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. We like cider. We like palms. We love orchards. And having fun, there is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. We like cider. We like palms, we like orchards, having some fun. There is a reason, there is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh yes there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet, oh yeah. We, we like cider, oh yes we do. We like palms, oh yes we do. We love orchards, having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. There's a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. We like walking down the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh, yeah. We like cider. We we like palms. Oh, yes, we do. We like orchards, having some fun. Yeehaw!